on the 18th of March 2019. The petition calls for the urgent passing of the legislation to provide for the regulations of foreign ownership of land to fulfill the directives and objectives of Article 16.1 of the Constitution to regulate the right to acquire property by persons who are not Namibian citizens, to reaffirm and give power, control and ownership of the land in Namibia to the people of Namibia and to provide for incidental matters. Procedurally, the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Constitutional and Legal Affairs is mandated to receive all petitions, and if the committee so deem necessary, uh, depending on the nature of the matter recommended, to standing rules to refer it to the relevant committee. In short, that is how the petition ended up with the Natural Resources Committee by referral uh, in terms of Rule 93C of the Standing Rules and Order on 12 April 2021. On 17 May 2021, the committee invited AR to a hearing on the petition scheduled for 18 June 2021. Unfortunately, that meeting could not have been realized because um, shortly after that, the country went into lockdown because of the uh, COVID-19 and assembly, I mean the assembly session were also suspended. The Standing Committee on Natural Resources has then the duty to consider any matter it deems relevant with regard to offices, ministries, agencies, and all state-owned enterprises and parastatals responsible for the following category of affairs, which shall in the area include agriculture, water and forestry, environment and tourism, fishery and marine resources, mines and energy, and land reform. It's also to monitor, inquire into, and make recommendations to the Assembly on matters that may directly or indirectly affect the natural resources of the Republic of Namibia and its people. Operate with a vision to promote sustainable utilization of Namibia's natural resources. Review and advise the National Assembly on the activities and matters related to the agriculture, water, and forestry. Ensure that government put restraint on environmental degradation and protect the environment. Review and advise the National Assembly on matters related to mines and energy sectors. Last but not least, ensure a fair distribution of farming land and productive utilization of it in Namibia. This is the first hearing we are having starting with the petition of uh, AYA. Subsequent uh, meeting with other stakeholders will also uh, follow suit in the coming weeks. And the AR has submitted a petition in form of a draft bill 
that we would like to to be legis I mean the legis the legislature to pass. As stated in our letter of the 17 May 2022, the committee would like you to give a summary of the bill with motivation for the proposal therein. You are also free to share um, with the committee any other uh, important or information or evidence that you deem relevant uh, to, to the petition. The committee's intention is to gather all relevant information, produce a report, and table it in the assembly during this uh, calendar year. I urge you also to provide information or evidence that is accurate and verifiable as the committee will undertake to verify all claims made by all stakeholders. And these stakeholders that I'm referring to, we are talking of the Ministry of Land, the Legal Assistance Centre, and the Ministry of uh, Rural Development, plus, plus any other uh, stakeholders. Uh, we are indeed honoured to have you here today, and I hope and looking forward to constructive deliberation. And after your presentation, I'll now, uh, after our presentation, we'll be looking forward as to what would be the outcome of your presentation. We, of course, uh, with the passing of events, we are uh, grateful that we are here to engage on an issue of national importance, to engage on a sentimental issue. But I'll share how we view the state from where we are seated. So there are three key particular important uh, stakeholders to the state. One is the public, in terms of uh, public office and uh, the public service. Two is the private sector. Uh, private sector in the sense that it is more of a profit-driven entity, but must enable the state to meet the nation's required targets. And then the civil society. Civil society that is on the street, is not profit-driven, looks at the issues in particular to ensure that they meet the, the necessary targets of, uh, of what is planned. Madam Deputy Chair, we come from the streets. We come from the clubs. We come from the churches. We represent the generation that is eager to see a reform in the way we conduct our affairs. Of course, we represent those that cannot be here. And therefore, we bring their views to the committee's attention. We do have all our own personal views, and we stand ready to defend those personal views that we have. But it is important for us to ensure that we bring about the views of those that are able to be here, the boys that are on the street, the young men and women who are the dejected masses of our people. Now, we intend to be very brief in our submission. We will start with an overview that will be given by Mr. Shipurulo, activist Shipurulo Ampanda. Uh, he's going to give us a comprehensive overview of where we are coming from and why we are here. Then we'll deal with the bill with its legal nature with by the head of legal, activist Kavetu, and we'll do a conclusion remark with our special envoy on this specific bill. 
Benedict Law. We, in closing, we simply want to say that we have a view that the National Assembly has been complicit in the oppressive legal and social economic regime that continues to suppress our, home, our people and subject them to a state of being landless, homeless, and subjected to arbitrary evictions and harsh rental markets and human living and in human living conditions on the farms named from the buildings. However, it is our hope that we sit with a, with a generation of revolutionary MPs that will take a decisive decision in ensuring that the land goes back to where it belongs to. That the land and our people are able to form and have a basis of living. We are only guaranteed our graves. Even the land that we have in the north and the east doesn't belong to us. We are simply renting from government. But there is a class of separation in how the land is treated in both spaces of the country. So, Madam Deputy Chair, we don't want to live in the shacks any longer. We want to change our lifestyles. We want to improve. We want to make sure that at least we coming from coming from where we are coming from in the past and in the present, we must be able to safeguard the future for our children in making sure that we are able to reform the laws of our country and also take decisive decisions in the best interest of our people. I thank you very much. Madam Chair, Article 1, Subsection 2 of the Arabian Constitution says that all powers shall rest in the people of Namibia. And those people of Namibia shall exercise this power through the democratic institutions of the state. So, in us as the people of Namibia, including the air movement and the young men and women uh, who are unable to be here, in us exercising our powers, we exercise our powers through you as our representatives, generally. So, and the Constitution goes further in Article 35 to be more specific that members of parliament shall be representatives of all people of Namibia. So in other words, the member of parliament, regardless of whatever political party, they are our representatives. What it means in native democracy is that they go to any member of parliament and say, please, can you look into this matter? Whether we do it in, in Namibia, uh, maybe it's also for doing that. So we are really coming here knowing very well that we are uh, we can exercise and express ourselves through you as, as our representative. So what I intend to do is that, uh, of course, President Mr. Mulgenia indicated we, and Mr. Kabeu will go to the legal details in terms of the case that we prepared, but we just wanted to give a context uh, of why we are saying and doing what we, we are saying here. Honorable Chair, we know very well that Namibia was given to to Germany in 1884, and that protest where they decided by themselves that we must belong to them. But we also know that the Germans, initially, their plan was not to, to, to come and physically establish the, the settler colony. They first allowed the companies to go and exploit uh, this. So when those companies started negotiating and gaining deals with our people, they then, uh, the German settlers who are here, the, the other militaries and others, they started asking back to Germany and saying, man, we have acquired these properties in this uh, German service after we need protection. So the soldiers were sent to protect the games that the settlers had made. To an extent that because of the patriarchal nature also of the Germans, they even had to send women later. Because the, the soldiers were coming here and the settlers here were mostly, mostly men. They had to send a ship at one point uh, full of women in order for them to, uh, to, to be able to do that. So we already see that the, from the beginning of this colonial project there was a selfish motive for the settlers to acquire, for the settlers to gain, for the settlers to, to exploit. Now, already by 1902, the white settlers, those ones that we are now describing just before the, 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 the the colonial state, the white settlers that acquired about 4 million hectares 
And I mean, 4 million, that's an equivalent to 4 million, 7 million stadium, or 4 million independent stadium, or any financing of you. The concession companies, because remember the companies came first, the concession companies had, had already uh, acquired 29 million hectares of land. And the colonial administration had acquired 19 million hectares. That's already by 1902. Six years later, by 1908, between, obviously, between 70 to 80 percent of the rural population had been exterminated, and 50 percent of the normal population had been exterminated. So, you have now killed all those people so you can move in and acquire that land. So, we're talking about 1902, they already had more than 30 million hectares of Namibian land. So, by 1908, when they exterminated those populations, particularly in the southern part of Namibia, they went further to acquire more land again by 1908. Between 1930 and 1940, about 30 million hectares were given to, because the Africans had a problem with this, what they call the Arab War. Africans are such a proud people, they cannot understand one of their own that are poor, so they saw it as an embarrassment. So they established what is called the Carnage Commission, uh, and they wanted to release really this poor African problem. And part of the resolution of this study, the outcome of this study, is to say that no, this, in order to solve the poverty problem, you must go to Southwest Africa and give the poor and uneducated Africans land. So they got uh, about 32 million hectares of land during that period. So this thing that we always hear that uh, our people don't know how to farm and all those things is a historical. Because land, 30 million hectares of land was given to poor and uneducated Africans during that period, with state support and state capacity uh, already by then. Again, uh, because remember, South Africa, I think, over 1915, and by this period, we're talking about 1940, 1940, when 32 million hectares of land were given to this uh, Africana, uh, it was under South African colonialism. So the, 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 the Second World War started in 1989 until 1945. So after the Second World War, in other words, after 1945, the soldiers that participated in that war, and which is known in the, uh, even in the when they say about Itaikira, Hitler's war, the soldiers, the white soldiers, were given an additional 7 million hectares of land as a reward for them participating uh, uh, in that war. So you see that our history at different defining moments, our people have been using lens dramatically. By 1915, uh, in Angra and then Angra Pequena is known as Lourdes today. So the labor situation has changed. But we're talking about 70 to 80 percent of the yellow and 50 percent of the animal population in southern Namibia was already uh, exterminated uh, by then. So, because the colonial states did not have employees to work in the farms that had been acquired, to work in the mine that had been established. So in 1920, they established two organizations. The colonial states established two organizations. The first one is called Southern Labor Organization. And the other one is Northern Labor Organization. So the, 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 the Southern Labor Organization had an office in Ontario. So they, they, they were recruiting the laborers to go work in certain mines and farms. The Northern Labour's uh, organization was headquartered in Rundu. They were now getting the, the workers to work in Northern mines. So, so in other words, the, the Arabos, because the population had been exterminated, would work in CDM. That's why by 1990, 90% of the employees in CDM were from Northern Namibia. Because in other words, some of students, the, the TSL, T, TCL mining and the farms that are in the north, the laborers came from uh, NLO, from Rundle and other places. But the southern part, the farms and the mines, the employees came from, uh, from that NLO in the, 19, uh, in the 1920s. So, the, because this system was working in the 1940s, uh, 1942, I think. They combined NLO and SLO to create SWATLA. It was very notorious in terms of exploiting of, the, of our people. So I think everybody has experiences, and then some of you are freedom fighters who you know better than ourselves. Uh, everyone has experience about the brutal nature of the, 
for the for the contract data system. Last year, December, for the after close to 50 years, I drove. Uh, after 50 years, I drove one of my my grandmother's brother. <coughs> we discovered him after 42 years. When I did 72, part of his contract labor system he came to work at the farms. So when he came to work for the farms, we never saw him. And my grandmother always said that uh, he will go one time if I don't know. Uh, but uh, the one way we thought that he's dead. Reverend, I always say, we the end of that. <laughs> so, he, we never saw him for 42 years. And we discovered him in uh, 2016. That he is somewhere alive in some farms there in Okahaja. Uh, he did an ID. And he went for his country for, for all those years. He didn't have social security, he didn't have anything, he didn't have any form of documentation. So last year he went for the first time after 50 years home. His mother was uh, my grandmother's. Uh, his mother was my great grandmother's sister, and he was the only one. So he discovered after 50 years that his mother died in all those kids. And his farm, the farm where he lived for 40 years, was now sold uh, to these people. And they had these new owners do not want him anymore, so they had to be it. So. Now imagine a 78 year old man who had lived in the farms for all those years as some sort of generational farmer. Nothing would have happened to him. Of course, we are glad as the fact that you found it. But this is not my only story. I'm sure many other Namibians all over the 121 constituencies would relate to this problem that we now have. So, Madam Chair, the struggle. We know that the struggle was for the land, but we know very well that land is the thing of this uh, project of liberation. And this is what you are telling us as strategic politics, uh, as students, as, as youth activists, as youth leaders. You tell us that the struggle is incomplete. You tell us that the struggle was about land. You tell us that we need to wage a struggle of economic freedom. So we didn't effectively work with free time. You know how people will just be taken to jail and then without bail. And you have done very well. I'm talking about you as people that we are following in those two steps. Nobody debates about free trial anymore. We know that you are arrested after 48 hours, you must be brought before court. Otherwise, you will be released. But in the past, as far as the, uh, the, 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 land is, uh, the land is concerned, Madam Chair, we say that Namibia. The land mass, the size of our land is 800,000 square kilometers. That is the size of our land in our country. That translates roughly into about 42 million hectares. So in other words, about 42 million total stadiums uh, in our country. As we speak, Madam Chair, the current situation is that of these 82 million hectares, 39 million hectares, what can be referred to as freehold agricultural land, and some sort of land that, that is lawfully owned with title deeds and things like that. And I will go in details about it. what the Petri has done to us, for example, Article 16. Uh, that effectively, what it means is that at independence, the drafting of our constitution, the state expropriated communal land without compensation and became state land and protected these 39 million hectares of land. So in other words, land that belonged to the people, because in the village is that land, uh, that land that you have from here, is not yours. It's, it's belonged to government, you are only renting from government. So what government did in the constitution is say, he took that land from you. Before the constitution, the land belonged to you. But now he took it, the land belonged to the state, without compensation. And protected as we will go into details of that. So, this land now, the 89 million hectares, the agricultural field of freedom of land that we are talking about, if we go in details, white people own 70% of these 39 million hectares of land. So, in other words, they own 27 million hectares of the, this land with title deeds, this land that is. Market values and all those things. Why do you already own 27% of that land? This is 
managing water as that we had referred to as in our own English space and provided the digital information that has been provided uh, freely by the Namibia Statistics Agency and also collaborated by the Ministry of Land. Of these 39 million hectares of uh, freehold agricultural land, the blend was only almost 16%. 16% of this. The government only owns 5 million hectares of this land, which is a equivalent to 14%. From this figure, we know that there are 12,380 farms that are tied in our country. 7,000 of these farms are owned by the individuals. 2,300 of these farms are owned by companies. 1,200 are owned by government. 150 farms are owned by trust. And interestingly, I'm going to conclude 61 of these farms are owned by the JHS. So we actually have JHS in the country that own. We don't know whether it's white people that found a trick to register the farms in the name of the church is now the assume maybe uh is a Catholic okay, yeah. oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> so you already know. So that MPs are members of the Catholic Church, you don't agree with it. Yeah, okay. So yeah. So sixty one as what I'm taking a Yes. Uh, can we just uh, allow him to continue? Yes, 61 farms, the length, um, 60 61 farms that is constituted part of this program of the energy are owned by the JHS. So it's very interesting, and we must be interested in finding out exactly who. But of interest to the context of our discussion today, Honorable <coughs> Chair and Honorable Members of our government and the representative of our people, 250 farms measuring 1.2 million hectares of our land, which is equivalent to 1.2 million fruitful statements, are owned by foreigners. Now, this is why this is not highlighted. Now we have a problem with Africans and Germans and Congo, the ones that are Namibians. We are talking to people who are not here. Can you repeat that figure, please? 250 farms that measures 1.2 million hectares of land is owned by people who are in Moscow, people who are in Beijing, only the farms here. They are not here, they are not spending any money, they are flying once a year to shoot the rifles or whatever it is, because they have permissions so by the state to do all those things. Foreigners owning 1.2 million hectares of land. Now, if we go in the details to actually find how this uh, 1.2 million hectares is distributed, we discover that the Germans own 640,000 hectares. South Africans own 300,000 hectares. The Americans own 82,000 hectares of our land. Foreigners. We're not talking about fundamental, we are going to find fundamental data. We are talking about Kramer, who is in Washington. Yeah? So the, the Trumps are only 82,000 of our land. The Helen's Village are only 300,000 of our land. Uh, the Angela Baker are only 640,000 hectares of our land. Just a green day. It is a problem. And others we also have from Austria, from Switzerland, from the Netherlands, from China, from Italy and Canada. So if you Chinese here, then we're talking about the foreigners, what Chinese that are here? In Beijing, only farms here. It is very, 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 very problematic. But when our chair is come to the conclusion, the constitution, in fact we always have having this debate to say, man. This constitution that we have adopted is a problem, must be amended, things like that. But as your children, we went to look at this constitution very well. 
and try to understand, okay, why we are making the finding time to amend the constitution. Now, how do we study the constitution? To see what is it that we can do within the confines of the constitution. Because remember there is this debate to say, no, you cannot amend the constitution and all those things, but we are on the view that we can amend it, the whole of it. But before we even reach the amendment of the constitution, what does the constitution permit? What does the constitution allow for us to be able to deal with the same question as, as we understand? But if we are just isolating the issue of foreigners, I'm not talking about the whites in that we are just talking about the issue of foreigners. That's what we are primarily, because we think that that's a good way. We think that you, as a generation of MPs, when the history of our country is written, will be that generation. Of course, freedom of fighters are important, but who we'll remember all 104 of you? Who have done something significant in dealing with this problem of foreigners owning, uh, owning our land? Now, in Article 16, this is it's, it's amazing. It says, and it says that all persons shall have the right in any part of Namibia to acquire this box and whatever of property. All persons basically means everybody on earth. Everyone, no wonder that this statistic, no wonder what we do here. Uh, foreigners own land because the constitution says all persons, everybody on earth, can come here. In fact, they don't even have to come here. They just have to do a transaction through lawyers, they transfer their money. You can acquire land without stepping into Namibia, you can sell land because you can acquire and own and dispose. You don't have to come to Namibia. You don't have to, you can sign electronically just wherever you are. You can acquire and you can sell it, you can speculate and do whatever it is that it says. Already that's a problem in Article 16, Subsection 1. But it says that all people can do this. But provided that Parliament may, by legislation, prohibit or regulate, as it deems expedient, the right to acquire property by persons who are not an citizens. So this problematic constitution and problematic clause give us an opportunity to say Parliament can, however, regulate it. We are not going to be amending anything. We are not going to be changing this so-called uh, chapter 3 thing. We are just going to regulate in other way to fulfill that promise. Now, we are submitting uh, the chairs and we will go in that that promise, that constitutional promise, promise of Article 16, Section 1, that Parliament can regulate, can, can legislate, can pass by the Constitution say we do things, we can prohibit, we can just stop it all together. We can stop it all together or we can regulate. So in other words, prohibit, we say you don't come to this room as a foreign at all. But regulate means you can come in but you cannot sit at certain seats, you can sit there. So even as useless the provision is, in terms of the benefit of our people, it even goes further and says, if we don't want to prohibit the stop it all together, you can even regulate it to say, how are they going to own? But what has happened over the past 32 years, and we understand that our elders might have been busy or they looked at different things, that promise has never just been fulfilled. It's there, we don't need to amend the constitution. This parliament, you as MPs, could actually liberate our people and protect our people in terms of that, uh, that specific uh, prohibition. It simply just has not been done. And that's why we are submitting that this can be done. And in fact, we, this is not going to be the first time in the world something like this has happened. In time in 1954, the, the Hope. in fact, what they have done in Thailand first, they, they were they were saying that, uh, they were saying in the 1950s that you, you, when foreigners can own land, uh, when you have a treaty for religion and what, 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 some sort of treaty, there must be some countries that own some treaties, in other words, your government must have a relationship so that you can allow you to own the land. But in 1970, they did away with that provision. They had subsequent amendments and, and, and things like that. So we've done our research and we also make this copy available to, to the chairperson uh, in terms of that land code of Thailand, 
where they speak uh, committee secretary, where they specifically speak to, to this, and they use the term army. <laughs> Uh, and they, they are very clear in the, in the say where, where they allow foreigners to own them. For residence purpose, not more than one right uh, family is that right, I don't know now. Is that in other words, they say we can keep them for residential purposes, but they are very specific and to, and, and how much uh, are they going to uh, give you those things. Religious purposes and many other things. Uh, and they regulate these things. But now, if a person can come from Nigeria today, um, in the city of Windu, they, they just get a, a church, very far, but a member of parliament will struggle to get land there in the city of Windu. But we seem to want to give land to, uh, to people to establish churches. Maybe people have problems, our pastors, or the Rahim and others, maybe not. we don't believe they are good enough, maybe in the pastors, but we seem to accommodate all these people to others. But they are really making it entirely. As far as this thing is concerned. So they're very clear, because remember, one remember, the land will never increase. The land will never increase, it will keep decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. So, but not only that, in time in New Zealand, they are very, in fact, they were living a problem because a lot of foreigners were there, they are speculating in New Zealand, they started forming properties and many things like that. So it was a bit of a problem, they are also doing those interchanges in New Zealand. Uh, maybe the, the committee members can go to Thailand and also to New Zealand and see what uh, this thing is describing. So in conclusion, we are really here in hope that this generation of members of parliament will be our leaders. Because land will keep decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. And if we don't put a stop to it, you are going to have to remember the land that is owned by the Mexican. And how did these Mexicans end up owning it? It was retained as a game for eternity. Okay? This Rashid, how they did it very cleverly, this one is going to own the market farms. So they realized because of agricultural land, the foreigner cannot own it, cannot, uh, cannot buy it. They quickly came in a room and they said, okay, since you have talked with me from there, I'm going to buy it. One day, this foreigner buy it. And they say they are buying on behalf of government. After buying those funds on behalf of government, government is the same group say, hey, by the way, you can rent it for 99 years. The man who's buying it for is a 70 something year old man. So that farm obviously is going to give it to at least son and grandchildren for about 99 years, 100 years. All of us, there's nothing that is stopping you because Article 16 may provision for it. The current debate is to do away with 16. But we are submitting to you that before we even do our with 16, the same thing that we can put in for it, we can uh, regulate this. Uh, I'm going to end here in the interest of time, I'm going to go on, but we are told that we also have other responsibilities. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Mukanda. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mukanda, for the opportunity. Uh, I'll just start off with Dr. Mukanda left. And uh, maybe just to clarify the issue of Thailand, what, what Thailand actually did was uh, it set out, for example, in Article 16 of the Indian Constitution that you may regulate or prohibit uh, foreign ownership of land. What Thailand actually did first uh, in, in 1954, they tried to, to regulate first foreign uh, ownership of land. Where they they could allow foreigners to own land for, for commercial purposes, for example, certain, certain hectares, industrial purposes, and, and, and agricultural purposes. But what they did later in, um, in 1970, they realized that uh, the regulation of, of, of the ownership of foreign land, out of land, of land that, that foreigners was not really. So they did an amendment to the land code where they strictly prohibited. Uh, the foreign ownership of land in terms of uh, section 86 of the Iron Code. Um, coming back to our bill, uh, our draft bill, uh, it's very, very important to indicate that we, Parliament has developed a culture where uh, the submission of bills to Parliament is done by the executive. 
But it's, it's very important actually to stress that in law, every member of parliament may actually be get a, a draft bill submitted in parliament. But we don't know why it uh, has never happened since independence. And uh, maybe we would like to also encourage uh, the members of parliament and the representatives of all meetings to, to submit draft bills for consideration to parliament and, and not allow, because uh, members of parliament are as elected representatives as lawmakers. The executive as a separate branch cannot always be dictating to members of parliament on, on bills and be the one to submit draft bills. But parliamentary committees, a committee such as this, can all take ownership of this bill and submit this bill to parliament um, for, for approval. What we, what we want to achieve, as Dr. Mutaka has indicated, is, is nothing new. In fact, when you look at the Agricultural Commercial Land Reform Act, number six of 1995, as amended, has already uh, placed a prohibition of, of foreigners owning agricultural land in Africa. And um, that was done in terms of Article 16. Further, the, the Agricultural uh, Land Reform Act also made provision for expropriation of agricultural land or farms with just compensation. Uh, I think the problematic will by a uh, set up for me. So what we, what we are bringing to this committee today is, is not something new that has not happened. We are not asking um, this committee or parliament to this committee to, to commit to any or to, to commit to something that is either illegal or that has never been done before by parliament. Um, as Dr. Mpanda uh, has indicated, when we look at um, Article 16 of uh, Article 16 of the Indian Constitution, uh, basically Article 16 one guarantees uh, all persons the right to acquire own and dispose property. And then when we look at Article 16 two, it gives the power up, the, it gives the power to parliament to make laws that will allow the state to lawfully establish political of office to expropriate property in the interest of the state. So, um, Dr. Ampanda touched on, on the historical background of land ownership in Africa. Before uh, I just go through of what really happened during the time of the Constituent Assembly, that put it or it's actually a question from our side. What happened in the Constituent Assembly that has actually resulted in uh, the drafting of Article 16 in the way it is? Because I, I don't think the Namibian people actually understand what, what is meant by the provisions of Article 16. You know, before independence, before 1990, commercial land um, south of the red line was owned was strictly reserved for, for the whites and, and, and the foreign owners. So what has happened, what, what, what the Indian constitution did to Article 16 was to expropriate, because you know the, the black uh, inhabitants who live north of the, of the red line owned communal land. And, and those communal land rights were vested through uh, the different administrations of, of traditional not, we are not prepared the traditional authority anymore. The different administrations of, the, of traditional authorities. But what is happening is dependence with the confrontation of Article 16 was any land owned by the blacks, which was not of the, of the red line, was expropriated without compensation. I think that's the reality, unfortunately. Or fortunately, I know we like we don't like using the word expropriation without compensation, but basically what, what, what was done in practice, any land owned by the blacks north of the of the red line was expropriated without compensation. Because the American Constitution indicates that the communal land shall be in state. The same constitution says privately owned land or commercial land shall be I mean, it's protected in terms of adversity. And who could, who are the problem to all those commercial farms, for example? It's the white. So, when I take you to 
de qué le he contado lo que aquí me ha de qué he traído a lo que hay en el libro, de sexo de carne, pues de mamá. Y de qué he traído, o dato que he traído a las prayas de hombre, de que existe a los en tu hombre de mí, tu fans, y en la vida, o dos fans, si está a los en un hombre de mí, tu fans, o en la vida. So basically what, what, what we have done is the land owned by a blacks was expropriated and vested into the state. The land owned by white was protected in terms of access. But why, the question now we pose to Parliament is why did you invest the provincial land south of the red line in the hands of the state? If the communal land was expropriated. So, and, and that was the basis of of our submissions here today and the basis on which we, we provided this draft bill to file. Uh, just to go through the bill, before we go through the bill, uh, I would like to provide the context within which uh, the bill addresses the issue of, of foreign ownership of land. Uh, first, the bill will look at strict prohibition of ownership of land by foreign nationals. So the bill explicitly prohibits foreign ownership of land. And then the bill will provide for conditions and circumstances of utilization of land by foreign owners. I mean foreign nationals. So we'll prohibit, but we'll also provide for circumstances which they may utilize. We are not saying in which they may own the land. The foreign are allowed to utilize the land in terms of this country and we'll provide for those conditions. And then the second part of the bill The second part of the view will look at the existing owners of land. I mean, the existing foreign owners who own land in Namibia. What is going to happen to their land? In terms of those foreigners who own a urban land, those foreigners who own a agricultural commercial land, and those foreigners who are also leasing communal land, the Chinese nationals who are leasing communal land, not of the headland. So basically, the black working class who are leasing land from the state, not of the communal land. For example, when I'm saying I'm going on holiday, I'm going home to the 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 writing of that because it's being basically provided by the state. What I own is the house, the traditional land that I have. That's why when you look at the expansion of towns and village councils, when when they are expanding into your village. What government does, they pay you out for that traditional land. But when they expropriate the commercial land, the commercial fund, they value that land and they pay you out based on the value of the land. Not for the farmhouse we built uh, in 1950, for example. So that's the fundamental difference there. And then we we'll look at the general provision, which will touch on the expropriation of land. How the state, in terms of the deal, should expropriate the land owned by foreign business. And we we'll also look at the applicability of uh, existing legislation. There's a conflict of law with this, uh, basically, with this draft. And then we we'll also have to protect the proceedings. We we'll have to provide, I mean, protect the bill against proceedings in foreign courts. And basically, that sums up uh, our draft bill. Uh, maybe just to start off, basically, I think it's very clear who the foreigner in terms of Article, uh, article 4 of the Namibian Constitution. The definitions and the qualifications are there on how you can be a student of that. So um, I won't be repeating that. I'll go straight to. I will go straight to the applicability of the act. The act uh, of the draft bill, sorry. It applies to all land that forms part of the territory of Namibia, of the Republic of Namibia, whether that land is state owned or owned by private individuals. 
Uh, the objective of the of the draft view of the annual income rate already highlighted by by the deputy chairperson of the committee is basically to prohibit uh, ownership of any land, foreign ownership of any land that is foreign here. As, as Dr. Ambar has indicated that as the system provides for the regulate, you can prohibit our draft view strictly provide for the prohibition of foreign ownership of the land. The same prohibition is already enjoyed under the commission uh, the before Just to, when we look at the at, uh, at section 401 of, of, of the draft bill, it provides that no land in a village shall be owned by foreign nation. So if you, if you are not an Indian, in terms of the traditional elements of the of the Indian constitution, you cannot own land in the Republic of the That's an outright provision as provided, as authorized by the in the Indian constitution. So, as opposed to regulating their ownership, when it comes to ownership, we have strictly prohibited such ownership. But we have allowed uh, under the border foreign nationals to utilize the land in Namibia, subject to the qualifications set up as uh, the system of the end. Okay, now we have uh, provided for circumstances under which foreigners may utilize land in a they, they may not own land, that's a strict prohibition, but they may utilize land for under certain circumstances in a They may be for the purpose of economic development. So basically, in terms of Section 5 of the draft view, the land will be owned by Jibrukendi or Honor Accreditation. A foreign national will be using that land may be that letting up from the state or other countries. But that is, is only for the purpose of economic development. That's one condition. Yes. Not for the, for the purpose of, of, of duty in church, for example. It should be for the purpose of economic development. And, and, and the circumstances under which that a foreign national may be that letting it's also provided for uh, under Section 5 that such foreign national must be in partnership with an Indian citizen in which, in which such partnership you need your lease agreement on that land 51% of the factory of, of, of the economic development um, you want to set up must be beneficial for the Indian citizen. Beneficiary owned by an Indian citizen means that we know uh, people are being used as proxies. We have picked up that a lot in this country. So when you, when you are a beneficial owner of something, 15, 51 percent, it basically means legally that you control, you control over the operations, you have uh, finance over the operations and you have it. So, is, and that is explained also under us to provide that the effective control and management of the partnership, which partnership may be in the form of any recognized risky personality, must be in the hands of the media system. So what happens, because now we, we know we have a very serious problem on, in terms of the structure in which lawyers may be able to structure this disagreement that will end up uh, even providing for some set of backdoor ownership for such a So what we have indicated at our session by is that such is an agreement may only be concluded upon an application being made on the prescribed form to company. So if, if you get to this any land to do as a foreign national, you need to make an application, you need to attach that lease agreement and make an application to company to authorize. But it doesn't end there with company. Because what we have learned, one thing that has taught us about uh, these farms, that, uh, the way farms, I know PGM is very in that case in the high court, and they have taken the that decision. Uh, the issue of the farm that, that we've got by is the Russian issue, by, by Russian national 
what has happened today is um, the part of the data is from 99, so you get to the state, and then this from 99. And it seems this, all these arrangements were done with the assistance of the minister. Yes. So basically, you know that, as I indicated in my introductory um, paragraphs, that the agriculture land reform can prohibit foreigners from owning agricultural land. So he directly could not own uh, the farm. So he bought, donated the farm to government, probably on the advice of the minister on how he could actually end up legally circumventing the law that the agricultural land reform act and owning those farms through a legal agreement of 99 years. So important to curb that what we have indicated under section 5 is that one cabinet receives um, such an application for this. And if it's of the view that the applicant will bring economic benefit to the media, cabinet must submit the application for taking and approval by government. Most people will ask the interference of, of, of that will probably constitute the interference of parliament uh, in executive. That will constitute the interference of, 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 um, of the National Assembly in the execution of, of, of the executive powers. But we need to understand that the appointment of the ACC director, for example, goes to the cabinet with the president is the political party. So it's nothing new that practice exists within our constitutional democracy. And also to prevent, because we are not taking chances within the ownership of land by foreign nationals in this country. And we don't want to. So uh, basically, foreign nationals will only uh, lease the land and set out in Section 5 for commercial purposes. And also, when you look at um, Section 5 of Section 3 of the draft, we provide that no lease period existing 10 years from the moment. However, the lease agreement may be used upon the same application process. For example, how do you how do you lease? You know that for minimum length or not of the right line, you lease it from the state for a period of 99 years. So you want to lease land to a foreign owner for 99 years. That's basically what we like to continue. So it's been very That that uh, there we basically add up at one, we basically touch on going forward what the bill is proposing, not on what is it, what could happen to existing uh, foreign owners. So under part two, we for the draft we will basically touch on the on the existing foreign owners. What is going to happen to the land that the Campana Island that is owned by by um, the Americans, for example, or the South Africans. Some of them were in uh, Aspen Farms. So what we propose to, to, to the community and Parliament uh, is that if ever land is lawfully owned by foreign nations prior to the commencement of this act, this is the draft of it, such land shall be made owned by foreign nations. Okay. This is a second presentation on what could happen. Such alien land that is lawfully owned by a foreign national shall not be sold, transferred, or be with to another foreign national after the commencement of this day. So that foreign national will own the land. We are still coming to the expropriation under the provision of the draft, but you will own that land, but you will never sell that land to a foreign national or be with it. So basically, uh, ownership or transfer of such land can only be affected to the nation, the Indian nation, or the Indian government. Um, as I indicated, I'll come to the provisions that use the expropriation of such land uh, later in the draft um, But it's, it's quite a short period. We are already at um, section 7, and I think it's only about 10 sections. So I'll, I'll be working out soon. So, now, what happens to agricultural commercial land 
that is owned, currently owned by college. Those farms. We spoke about Airbnb. Let's not confuse the two. The land which we have indicated that can continue being owned by colleagues now, but urban land. We are going to an agricultural commission. So, agricultural commission land that is owned by all national prior to the commencement of the act, which is this draft, shall be expropriated by the state in three years from the date of commencement of the act, in accordance with the existing laws. However, we know willing buyer and willing seller is not working. However, foreign nationals who enter into a partnership with an Indian national after the commencement of this act, which partnership has the effect of reducing the foreign nationals' ownership into the land to not more than 49% and transfer not less than 50% ownership to an Indian national? Or inside an national? Who is previously disadvantaged as defined by the Affiliation Act shall not be subjected to this provision. So, basically, what we are saying is that if you own a farm, commercial or agricultural land, what will happen is that if you, within those three years um, from the passing of the, of the draft bill of the Act, if you own agricultural commercial land in the coordination, if you transfer 51% of such ownership to an immediate then your land will not be subjected to expropriation. Um, the the reassignment of percentage ownership is in subsection 2 shall comply with the provision of the agricultural commission. You have been indicated that when you look at the agricultural uh, commission land reform act, there are certain qualifications that have to be made for you, for example, to start to make the land and, and all of that. So we would allow that to comply with such subdivisions. So we have dealt with urban land. What will happen to urban land that's currently owned by foreign nationals? We have dealt with uh, commercial land which will be agricultural, commercial agricultural land which will be expropriated in three years. We are moving um, under section 8 to communal land. We are aware currently that uh, communal land is done through the customary land rights for the communal land reform act. Is set out uh, in the constitution, and as such, no foreign national is allowed to utilize land for interest. When it comes to communal land, when it comes to our villages north of the red line, for example, or any communal land, any communal land um, south of the red line, such land will not be subjected to be utilized by foreign nationals. We already prohibited the foreign national from owning such land. Basically, what we are saying is that you may as a foreign national huge lines through this agreement, commercial land. Yeah. But communal land, you are never setting your foot on communal land, not even to utilize it. That's the proposal of the deal. And any allocation of communal land to a foreign national before this act shall be deemed to have been an illegal transaction. And shall be Appreciated. If you are a Chinese national owning land in Hong Kong right now, what we are proposing is that from the day from which this act is passed, such land must be appreciated. It must just affect the state. We know popular land is not owned probably the Alistair probably the Vietnam got at least uh, the Alistair probably also for many years, and even many years in communal areas. But we are saying that is a human. The day on which the, the, the president signs this law in mean, this bill into law, forget about such rights. And, and, and to go further, you will limit such rights, and immediately you are not getting allowed to be such rights. So, we have touched on urban land, I have touched on uh, agricultural, commercial land, and communal land. Now we are going to the general provisions under chapter 3. We, since we know that chapter 3 of the Nigerian Constitution is the one that deals with uh, what other, some legal minds believe is, cannot be amended, or it can be amended but it cannot be removed. But I believe any law, any provision in the Constitution that does not 
le fait que la foulée des opérants de l'Union européenne l'ont dit. So, uh, under chapter 3, we, are, we touched on expropriation under Article 9 of the draft bill. And Article 9 provides that it is in the public interest and in the attainment of the objectives of this act. And to allow for ownership of land by Namibians in general and indigenous Namibians in particular, the state shall expropriate every land owned by foreign nations in the public interest. So basically, ever then, we have indicated that the foreign nationals have continued to, to be the owner of such ever land, although we indicated that commercial, commercial and industrial lands have been expropriated. Now we are providing for expropriation of ever land owned by foreigners. If it's in a public interest in attainment of the objective of this. For example, Dr. Mpanda spoke about uh, Switzerland. Um, in Switzerland, what they are basically doing now, they have realized, sorry, yes, New Zealand. Yes. What they have realized now is that the estate industry in, in, in New Zealand, in New Zealand, has been pushed beyond the affordability of its citizens by this foreign And we are, we are going through this, the exact same thing here. The equity has been property prices are very high in I remember, I remember you could buy a farm in 2000, you could buy a farm for 1.2 million. Now you can only buy prices that are being pushed by foreign nations. When you look at uh, this place here in New Zealand, and, and, and houses, they are owned by foreign nations. They are the ones listening, and they have the financial resources to buy more. So the media nationals will continue to live from this foreign nations. And, and that was what New Zealand is trying to, to regulate the community. That's why in the healthcare industry, I don't know whether they are they find out the process that they are. They're in the process of, of bearing foreign ownership of urban land or properties. Because they are the, the, the the New Zealand nationals they no longer have contract prices in their own country. I know commercial banks uh, they will be very happy because and, and you know what we did, for example, as, as, as commercial banks and as with the assistance of Bank of India, instead of finding means to reduce the cost of housing, they they increase the number of years we are supposed to pay for property to gain more. So what they realize is that the property prices are so high and they see nothing wrong with that and they want the property prices to, to continue to rise. But they realize that the poor working class can no longer afford them. So how do we make it affordable to them? It's by like moving from 30 years to 30 years. And as member of parliament, we are watching this, this campaign under our own system. And we are giving you an opportunity through this bill to put an end to that. Bank foreign ownership of land, ever land. That's one step. The, best step. the second step reduce the number of years in which commercial banks are financed. If you are buying a property, if I can buy a car for five years, why can I not buy a house for five years? They have realized that it's not affordable. They have increased it to 30 years. And when it comes to expropriation, I think we, we are a constitutional democracy. I think we have all emphasized our, our constitutional democracy. We are more than 30 years down the line. We are no longer suffering from um, um, the history of oppression, for example. We are no longer really, um, we are no, no longer counted by by the history of the oppressive white regime. But we have reached a point where we have to look forward in, in the attainment of the uh, innovation. And for example, look, when every time we talk about expropriation of land, while we expropriated communal land is dependent without conversation, we always look at as those to mean that the bias, the price 
con el de la serie en norte. A mí soy de Seba, como si se le fue a una serie de traje. La suya de Steven dice que fue el audio que se hizo tomada por el asociado. So, por ejemplo, el equipo de clase que está hablando de Chelsea y Football Club. Pero hoy en un camino dice, tú ves la gente de las sanciones y que dice, cosas de las que dicen. Yo le dije que yo hablo de un físico de la gente de las propiedades de Chelsea y Football Club. Con un tal conversación. And here, we don't only provide compensation, but we allow the seller or the corrigation of the sacrifice. I'm selling you really for 10 billion, pricing you out of ever winning that day. So, uh, we, we, we have overemphasized uh, certain rights over the rest of us. And um, just to proceed, when we look at uh, As I've indicated that we look at the conflict of laws and we have provided for that under section 10, we have indicated that because this act fulfilled an outstanding decision to, to have a longer right to the immediate constitution in this article 16, it shall be regarded as the primary legislation in a so far as it may conflict with any other laws. Obviously, the Indian Constitution is the Supreme Law. But if there is a law, for example, that the Council of Bank is uh, reform act, which provides otherwise as what is provided for in this bill. What we basically provided for is that this uh, draft bill was So any conflict which allows foreign owners to obey any other laws shall be invalid as far as uh, uh, this act provides. And then we actually have to provide for the protection uh, from proceedings in foreign courts. As we know, the moment you, you start touching these foreign measures, for example, most Americans who own all these funds, 1.2 million hectares of land, they will drag you to their international courts and international tribunals. And that's why we have indicated that the interference and interference to Article 1-2 of the Indian Constitution. This act shall not be. Because uh, basically Article 1 provides that Nubia shall be a sovereign state on its own. So this act this this shall not be subject to proceedings in any foreign court of Argentina. The Americans enjoy the same protections in terms of their laws. You can never break them before other courts on the events or laws of their own country. And all disputes arising from any provisions of this act shall be adjudicated in the Republic of Namibia in accordance with the laws of Namibia. And basically, to sum up, uh, this act is called the Regulation of Left Ownership by Foreign Nations Act of 2019. Uh, so we submitted the bill in 2019 and COVID um, disrupted everything. Although we can see that some other things have also taken place in our appeal, we have, uh, we have seen uh, we have seen our ocean views that, that are being pushed ahead of the land view and all of that. Although we stay in 2019. And surprisingly today, the 15th, and on the 18th of March, which is Friday, they shall mark three years since the submission of this of this decision. Yes. Um, unless I left out something, uh, basically that, that constitutes uh, our job in all the teaching funds. Thank you. And um, honorable members, there we have it. Uh, everything was put on the table. It's now for us to seek clarity if there's something that perhaps was not clear enough or any other uh, intervention, please, the floor is yours. No more members? Um, we just wanted to, maybe five minutes before the intervention, we have that one. Two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Uh, just to give uh, uh, 
our special input to make sure that we cemented the intervention properly. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Members of the Committee here. Uh, very quickly, uh, in the interest of time, I will try to be brief as possible. Uh, I just want to give context uh, of the data the contribution of agriculture apart from the very critical points which my fellow colleagues have mentioned here. Uh, the idea is the historical context, the sociological, the economical, and uh, of course uh, other very important uh, factors which have to be taken into consideration to make sure that we are at the end of the day able to get this through. Uh, you, you will realize that uh, from 1884 up to now, what we are seeing is that then this position started to manifest in different forms. Whether it's urban land business, or whether it's uh, uh, the, the lack of land uh, to be able to be agricultural productive, they are seeing it manifest all over us. It's, 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 it's only present. And unless we make a deliberate uh, effort in, 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 in salvaging and this deteriorating situation in our country, uh, we, 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 can, we can forget about it, it, the, the, the construction, the, the national reconciliation uh, uh, mission, which all of us we are very good at. What is to be done? What, what, what is our way forward? And I think my fellow colleagues, uh, activists in chief, Dr. Amubata, made very clear uh, Apart from the, 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 the historical facts, activist uh, activist was also very clear in terms of the legal context, which will at the end of the day guide uh, this very important document. So, just in short, what to be done? It is for us at the end of the day to make sure that. Prohibition takes place, that, that there could be no way that we allow for a foreigner to, to own land at the expense of the majority of land. Prohibition must take place. But not only prohibition, but we also allow for this land is what we are saying it could be referred to regulation. So at the end of the day, uh, we, 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 we are not only uh, saying to foreigners, no, uh, uh, you are not to invest or you are not to occupy the expense of the majority of land, but we are also making a provision for those particular foreigners who have an interest in our country to, to, to do so, but also to have due regard for, for, for the inhabitants of this country. So, uh, in the nutshell, Prohibition must take place, regulation must take place, and uh, there, there would be some of the, 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 the uh, regulated variables as suggested by Hector Escaveto that will help us at the end of the day to make sure that the concern which we have of chasing our investors is not going to take place. Uh, there's no way that we'll be able to chase our investors which comes to the media. For the, for, the, for the good intent to, to have a mutual uh, beneficial uh, relationship with this country. So, uh, the, 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 in the main, the, the scale of propaganda uh, tactics uh, is something which, at the end of the day, uh, we need to be vigilant of, we need to be careful of, because uh, in doing that, in lending and giving uh, to all of these uh, scale of tactics that we might teach in a way, into a form of analysis environment. It's just for us, it's just to attack that which we should have taken place in October 21st, 1999, and that is the return of the veterans, uh, and that, that, that is to, to, to give a, a clear uh, uh, significance to what Article 1 is suggesting. Article 1 is very clear, and that is to give over the power to the people. Now, how do you do that? You have to do that through. Uh, giving over also the land, because in land is, 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 is economy, in land is spirituality, in land is, uh, is, is culture. 
So, 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 so for us to say today, uh, 130 million or how many million uh, hectares of, of, of land in, in the hands of or foreign hands, uh, lying idle, why we do that, which is also another fact, which is the agricultural uh, uh, side of things, where we can give impetus to, to, to the agricultural economy of this country. But now, the land is lying idle. Uh, we have a very additional uh, uh, challenges of unemployment, poverty, and hunger, and inequality as well. So, for us to be able to, 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 to not only mitigate, but as well, you, you have your, you know, you know uh, what you call it, the, the uh, agenda 2063. Uh, Ambitions, which will make very clear that we, we will have to find some way and means to be able to challenge uh, poverty as well as other and all these things. So, what we do for this bill, we are sure not only as the government of the British Movement, not only as the protest uh, uh, was out there, who formed part and parcel uh, of that march uh, in, in March of uh, 2019. But for posterity as well, for our children's children, to make sure that we don't have foreigners at the end of the day to come and impose perpetual periods for which many people have sacrificed for, many people have laid down their lives for, but uh, 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 because of some compromises which had to be made leading up to the height of, of, of the Revolution's time in 1888 to 1889. Uh, it, 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 it is incumbent upon us of this generation not to let, let this uh, line happen and to make sure that uh, at the end of the day uh, the land is returned to its right people. This struggle was for the land. And uh, if we are not honoring our slogan, uh, it's not where being in the struggle, if I can put it that way, in short. Uh, before we proceed, I would just like to have an indication as to how many members are going to the other committees all of us attention, and at the end of the day, whatever we are going to achieve is for the benefit of all of us. Yes, some of us by as it was alluded to, the missing of 99 years. The majority of us here will not be there if I own one today. Uh, therefore, those who are going for the other committee, please. Thank you very much. We are all here exhibit. I do not see any names. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the picture person, again uh, the floor. Uh, on the other side, I would like to commend uh, the colleagues, fellow citizens there, member of the R, for, for the good presentation they have given us this morning. Uh, history told us uh, that it is the young. Nationals that always waged struggles in any given society, uh, including our own country, Namibia. The struggle for the liberation of this country was waged by the young people uh, of that day. Uh, we are politically. Independent, but economically we are not independent. And land is one of the primary factors of production. Uh, we cannot uh, agree more with you on that point. Well, we did what we said. We have some legal ideas, and the migration. It is about uh, chapter 3, which is 
always a thumb in the flesh of all the citizens of this country. You refer to Article 16, sub, sub Article 1, that you suggest that need to be uh, attended to by the legislators. I understand that uh, an act is a statute, it is subordinate to the Supreme Law, the Constitution. Uh, in your research, maybe you can advise us in case an act is made uh, to place that provision and this is tested in the court of law. What is the funding? What is the funding? What is the assurance? Because uh, uh, you are not the only one who approached me, as the chief president said, or not chief president said, who still want to engage with my stakeholders. Just like me on that one. Thank you very much uh, for the floor once again, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable uh, President. Thank you very much, uh, I'm going to add to the other point. Maybe just information first is that we uh, inform the, our, our, our guests that exploitation of, of, of land partly depends on the inflation in the south of this country. They were bastards, for example, their private land that was transferred to the state and then it was proclaimed to be state land. Uh, it's just, that was then um, one that was also indicated uh, it was a question as to why we don't bring those private amendments to Parliament. Uh, maybe just information is just that you know we are not only lawyers like that, they said that we don't keep Kavana. Uh, we don't have that legal uh, background to come up with, you know really strong bills to to address issues out there. So uh, if we have the support from 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 uh, say legal team we could do uh, we can do that for us we will really appreciate that. Um, then this is a very good question. I just have one issue or problem on, on this draft but it is on page eight of your of the bill. Um, section 7 2. Section 7 2. Yes. We, we talked about the, the previously disadvantaged audience. I want you to remove the two. Previously disadvantaged. People who are sitting here, we are also previously disadvantaged people. But we are, we might be a bit better off now than years ago. So we will not draw the line. And I'm just afraid that this will open up again a gap for the already connected to be to take advantage of this. So if you may just look at that Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Panvik. Any honorable um, extender? Yes. Yeah, um, thank you very much, um, Honorable Deputy Chair. Let me also thank the activist, the chief activist and our team for a very thorough presentation. Something that is stimulating our thinking in terms of what we want to do as parliamentarians and think that we uh, have done perhaps because of uh, um, other thoughts we did not come to that point where you have basically brought up this very very important uh, deal for this country. Honorable Deputy Chair, I, I would uh, assume that even if you give us another 30 minutes, we will not do justice to, to this discussion. Because 
is, is very important, number one. Number two, there's a lot of information. If you listen from what Dr. Jopan Mubad has very stated of work, um, to the legal person and to the colleague, uh, the activist, or the, what do you call it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 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 well. Uh, I really think that uh, we need to put justice in that. Because I know for a fact intuitively that um, when this bill hits Halak, you need to have a committee to own this, the committee is to do justice to the questions that will be posed for this particular bill. I believe that we need more time to discuss, not want to delay it like it was done for the past three years, but to discuss it further. Because if you look at where Dr. Ramakanda started off with, in terms of the land issue, the general land issue, and what the bill is aiming to achieve is but a portion of the whole land issue. Because Dr. Ramakanda spoke about what happened at independence, how the state basically separated the approaches to private land versus communal land. He even went to the point of elaborating quite eloquently about the settlers, how they came here, how they eventually acquired land, and, and then quantified the, the ownership of land, how many millions of hectares are owned, how many Soccer fields are owned by the, the, all the, the media people in different, different categories. So I, I believe that that is something that needs to be interrogated much further. Perhaps maybe that might come from the, the young minds. And that is understandable also because all the issues around land cannot possibly be addressed in one piece of legislation. It, it might be different pieces. Uh, uh, John also spoke about the extermination of people. It has led to some of the ancestral men being taken away from them are occupied by other people. That's also an issue. So I believe that, from my perspective, this is a, and I know for a fact that, uh, you know, eventually, instead of looking at this bill from a practical perspective, politics will also kick in. Self interest will also kick in, you know, depending on where you are in. in the but therefore, I would want to reserve my general <coughs> comments on this bill because I, I would want to engage further with uh, AR and the activists on this bill, uh, maybe on this platform as well. But I want to go to Article 16 because I am not a lawyer by tribe. Number one. Number two, the appointment of politicians to parliament is not on the basis of our competency, it's on the basis of our popularity. I was voted into the schools because I was a popular person. So, I think it's only a general Now, so you are now voting, can you stick to the. Well, you must have to take me from interference. Because if I have to, um, I might just react to something here. Article 16. 
And I just need to understand this because it says that all persons shall have the right to any part of Armenia to acquire and dispose of all form of immovable and movable property individually or in association with IA and to equip their properties to their heirs and legatees. And then he said, provided. And that is where I need to understand the legal interpretation of that provision. Provided that Parliament may, by legislation, prohibit or regulate, as it deems expedient, the right to acquire property by persons who are not Namibian citizens. What is the legal interpretation of that article? 16, sub article 1. So, Dr. mentioned that yes, somebody can come into this room, but then the owner of the room can say that you must take that seat. That's the only seat that has been allocated to you. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, I just need to understand that particular provision, whether that provision did not negate. The, the foreign national to own land. Does it not negate foreign national to be part and parcel of that all person? How does it interpret it in, in the law? Does it mean that this, this provision, because it's actually a provision that, that it means the, the, the first part of Article 16. So I thought in, in, in the way I read it up until today, I thought that yes, foreign nationals can come in, provided they are allowed by us to come in. That, that's my understanding of that particular provision. Uh, so, and then perhaps just to, uh, to ask another question, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not, I cannot complete what. I wanted to ask. It's the question of Namibia being a sovereign country. I think my young boy Kaveti, activist Kaveti, mentioned that uh, actually closing the door for a challenge by a foreign national in a foreign jurisdiction. And that's what I understood. Is that, is that are there no international treaties that might prohibit us from actually doing that, from a legal perspective? But I just want to know, because if we have such a provision in our laws, why do we leave this country so wide open? Because this country, apart from the land that we're talking about, have been complaining about the ownership of our economy, how, we, how the, the economy of this country is structured. Is number one a franchise economy? Number two, it is an economy where even our extractive industries are basically, for all practical purposes, owned by foreigners. And it's through the laws of this country that made that possible. I mean, if you look at the president when he was talking about the oil discovery, he was actually saying that legally we don't own. And the source, you know, the resources, the Canadian resource, and it's, it's because of the law of this country. So I just wanted to know about those two specific issues, but I believe that for the uh, chair, we need to have another uh, round of discussion with AR to get more justice, to do justice to this particular piece of uh, uh, appeal. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can we, for the sake of Honorable Fanbe, who has to be excused, perhaps, if, if you can respond to his uh, question, and then after his speaking, like this, we can continue and give the second round of other members who may post questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, thank you very much, Fanbe, for. For a wonderful question. Uh, in fact, 
I think two, three days ago we were having this discussion with uh, my students. I think generally the, we have not had enough conversation about this affirmative action. What does it mean? Who does it include and who does uh, it exclude? In South Africa, for example, the word in our law, I have not come across the legal concept of African. Yeah, literally the, the legal concept of African. So in South Africa, the, what it means black in Namibia, and what it means uh, African, it might be very problematic because South Africa had an opportunity to engage this conversation. Let me give you an example. In the legal practitioners at independence, they, 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 were, they, they, they were more white lawyers than black lawyers. So then the legal practitioners, like they must now elect this president and what, what in the leadership of the uh, uh, law society in Namibia. So they, they, there was an amendment to the legal practitioners act, I think, that make provision for this thing. So in that law, they make a provision that this year, the president of the law society will be black, uh, I think as they say previously disadvantaged and this year will be white. So that's what they've been doing after independence. So with the passage of time, you now start producing a lot of black lawyers. And our children started coming back wherever they're studying law. So we are now having more black lawyers than white lawyers. So because the thinking at the time, it was not strategic. So the whites were in minority now in law, in law, in terms of the membership. Uh, they are just saying, no, we are enjoying the law. This year is our time. So the lawyers have a practice that is not been democratic. The, the fluctuation of the basis of race, even something that doesn't make. The purpose was to restore justice. So you have to be very strategic about that. Now in South Africa, when they say black, or oh, in fact, if I go to that, now they have this situation where white or previously disadvantaged which is what we have interpreted as black, because we are afraid of using the word black in our law, unlike the South Africans. So, Stina Wu and Jack Wang, I'm sure they, they have uh, permanent residence or even diplomatic passports now in our country. So, if Stina Wu or Jack Wang's daughter, yeah, and after becoming a lawyer, is now an admitted legal practitioner as a member of the law society of Namibia, and they come there and they, and they and the AGM, I wonder what they're going to do. Because you're not qualified for either categories. Because the Chinese are not white, they are also not previously disadvantaged. What, what's going to happen and in a situation like Because we've not done a thorough job when it comes to those things. Now, it's the same thing with the South Africans. The South Africans have actually, when they mention the word black, in the category of black, there are three subcategories that constitute this black. One is the colors, two is the Indians, three is the Africans. So it gets to be complex. The colors are part of the blacks. So in other words, in the South African context, what we regard as the pastors are black. The Indians are black. The Africans are black. So, but without that thorough understanding, now the, 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 the blacks don't even identify themselves as Africans. So, in fact, not every black person is African. So, it gets to be very complex because we have not gone a step further to actually go and define. Because we try to use the word previously itself. That, what we are explaining, is exactly part of the problem because we shy away from the word black to go and define it. We have all these previously disadvantaged. You just call it what it is, black, and you identify and you define. That's why South Africans are not having a problem with this uh, affirmative action. Whether you look at the composition of bonds and, and things like that, they, they have that factor, that determining factor. If you just check, for example, how many whites are in, in the bonds, you, they might even go to 15% because of this confusion. Because we are able really to define the concept very well, and then you are able to do that. Historically, what has happened is that, again, uh, there was a student of mine who wanted to, to do research on the pastor identity and the participation in politics. You see, at one point, you had had one problem in Drell where you see, for instance, 
if you have body in Lemon, but historically and culturally. Uh, if it was up to me, I would have been Lemon in that area, I would have been communal land. Supposed to have been communal land because the cultural community. Now you have a situation where the captain, as a matter of practice and culture, the captain was allocating land. If you are born there, you will, it's your natural right to have access to a plot. Yeah, that's why if we only had in our country, we only had two deeds office. The one for Windu and the one for Rehobo. So that's why we had the, those problems of a plot in Rehobo, the town council have allocated and the captain has also allocated. So in terms of culture, you would even think that customary law is recognized by our constitution. But at the same time, the town of Rehobo. So that's why there was those problems because they didn't. I think Rehobo generally for me, is one of those unsolved problems. There was no decisive leadership uh, to be able to understand. There was a study that was done by uh, the late Paramount when he was attorney general. Uh, he had done some studies in terms of what, but after that, the government never really went to the ground and see what is it that you uh, that what is it that you must do on the question of revenue because this is historicity. There's a historical makeup of railroad. How did it? How was it integrated? How was it organized? How? So it, it, it would be. I would have thought that it would have been remained a communal, and so that we are able to recognize the customary laws because there is customary law in railroad. But now it is a subject of the of 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 even of the what is it called uh, local authority act and all those uh, specific provisions. So we are definitely aligned to to what has happened. Uh, whether there was an expropriation of land, there is a, a judgment now that was done by the Supreme Court that customary land rights until, because remember in this process where we have a government compensation policy, but the government compensation policy is very shocking when you read it, is that when these towns expand, they will have Marula, Tri, Marongo, and all those other things. So in other words, in the imagination of those who were drafting a national policy, they had a particular orientation. So they would say, because probably the target was to Ondamwa, Kavango, and all those in the north, because they wanted to move a step further. They ended up having a national conversation policy that identifies particular species of trees. But it's also applicable in Rehobo. So if you don't have a marula tree, you have a tree. Yeah? So if, when you go and read that policy, those are the things that you find. But I don't think that we have done a general job. For example, in those traditional, when Rehoboth expands and there's no Marula tree, how are you going to do measurements in terms of the conversation policy? I think it's something that we, we probably need to. We agree that uh, it may be open to abuse, but it's because we are not clear. Since I was a student at the University of Namibia, we were struggling with BEE, Black Economic Empowerment. It changed to death and it came to Travel B, what, what, and why people just say, hey, nothing, don't, don't implement it. So it's been about 10 to 15 years now. It's because we don't, we are not clear, there are bastards who think that they are not black. It has become very problematic. So when we speak of black in that context, uh, they, 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 in their imagination, they think they are not included in that conceptualization. So because they believe that they may not be included in that conceptualization, it becomes very they become very apprehensive towards something that's actually supposed to benefit them in their, their reality. I believe once we are clear on this, uh, on this matter, so we know exactly what has happened to Remo historically, uh, but we just wanted to give uh, that general historical context. But I think the people of Remo, they have always remained resolved. They were resistance, even in terms of our liberation struggle, the early petitioners, some of them have been from Remo, and I think if you know the Bukes family, uh, their great grandfathers have been petitioning just together with the uh, with the freedom fighter that later both went to form Swap. So they have been resolved all the way. But some were coming to independence because I mean when you go in the negotiation, it's, that's how it is. The result is a give and take. But I think in our history is very clear as far as that, that specific role. Uh, so that's the context which we were talking about. We are aware of that faster and the of what has happened. Uh, the previous disadvantage, but we do know that what is happening, we know that there has never been a, a bill that was tabled. But we also believe that things are changing. You know, things are changing a lot. Uh, let me give you an example. 
uh, vulnerability knows this very well. Yeah. Yes. Uh, at one point, yeah, at, one, <laughs> at one point in the Solar Central Committee, there was a huge discussion about these youth that are discussing bad matters on Facebook. This book face thing. It was very, <laughs> the, the leaders were very apprehensive towards that. And they went to take a resolution. But I can tell you today, in 2022, 99, in my high school, 99% of the members of SWAMO Central Committee are on, on, on book face. So things continue to change just like that. Whereas you are punished for something, the president now, every time, every day, the president is on Facebook and three times everywhere. So even with these things of bills, uh, things will naturally change. And, uh, but they will have to be casual at this first before it becomes normalized. Uh, and I think it's, I'm not too concerned about the fact that people are not having bills. Yeah, with the passage of time, members of parliament would develop that internal capacity. They would be able to present uh, those bills. And, to, uh, and might, you, might even be members of the ruling party would be presenting individual bills with the passage of time. <laughs> it looks like it's not possible now, but I can guarantee you that things are changing. It might happen. So I don't know, Madam Chair, whether I can just restrict the response to that because you have to go. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I, I thought we can push our meeting to half past yeah. 11. Yeah. Because apart from uh, those who are going for the other committee, initially our meeting ends at 11 as a written earlier. And uh, it's also for the purpose of what might have arranged for another appointment uh, after 11. And again, one might be going to prepare for the session uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. However, I will ask the intelligence of the members if we can uh, push our meeting to, let's say, quarter to 12. I think we have how more time to? 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock. Okay, so are you comfortable yes. with that time for of us? Even the next session. <laughs> Can you perhaps proceed with the response to the other questions before I ask for the second round of, of questions? Yeah, yeah. so the, the, the other two questions are actually similar. Uh, in so far as it relates to Article 16. So I will just give a general comment, then the government lawyer here will go into the specific details. Now, uh, I want to preface my response to my experience with the Chinese. So these Chinese, they, they we, we, I, one day I was in Beijing for the Young Leaders Forum. So there were the Chinese Young Leaders and ourselves. In those engagement, and the African started now talking about the behavior of the Chinese, how the Chinese behave, and why that behavior is very problematic. And uh, the Chinese simply responded to us and said, But we are not in your country, we are not implementing those laws, but you have responsibility. Why are you asking us about, about what the Chinese nationals are doing? In China now, if you are a Namibian, then you you are found with drugs. The essence which you do. There was a South African woman who was, uh, whose bed was found with drugs. In general, of Zuma, as president, was trying to intervene then to say, can the person not be arrested? No, no, the Chinese are very clear, they put you to death. What we learn from the Chinese is that the Chinese do not depend and wait for others to determine what must happen in their country. So they are very clear in terms of, uh, in terms of those things. Let me start. With the with the clarity that is sought, doesn't it negate foreign owners with the, 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 their rights? This is how we are reading it. Can we go in details? It says all people they can have acquired the rights. Then it says the provided that Parliament may by legislation prohibit. Our by our simple interpretation, for as long as Parliament has not done that. For as long as Parliament has not done that, 
foreigners and everybody else, all peasants. So the constitution says that this is what we are giving to everybody in the world, but you are allowed. Yeah, for another way, the owners of the room can lock it. But as long as that room is not locked, the rights of those people are remaining intact. We are not aware of that except for that agricultural land, uh, commercial land. That regulation is implicit by the constitution. So our interpretation is that it's not negated until and unless the day uh, parliament passes legislation that regulates or prohibits. So immediately once we have seen that it becomes uh, something incompatible go into details. Now, Rosalia asked about assurance for <laughs> me to be sure. And we agree that we need to be sure that when we go this path, is there nobody who can wake up and, and, and challenge. Now, they, they, there are two debates. The debate is that this chapter 3 must be amended. You know, the people are fed up and they just say chapter 3 must be amended. But now, for us, we realize that for you to amend chapter 3, you must, you must convince the two-thirds majority of parliament, you know, for you to do these things. And that process of convincing them is a tedious process. And uh, more so if you are not in that political party. But even if you are in that political party, there's no guarantee that you will convince everybody to, uh, uh, to, to, to be able to do that. We then separated that debate to say, okay, fine. Why we are going to amend Article 16? In chapter 3, what is it that we can do? So already we are framing this debate to say uh, this is the passage. So the Constitution makes provision for that in Article uh, 16. So it's permissible, it's allowed by that. So in other words, the members of Parliament are not proceeding to say we want to amend the Constitution, we want to interfere with the Bureau of Rights. Uh, members of Parliament are saying no, we are proceeding from that promise. We, we are allowed in the Constitution. It's like the Constitution would say that there must be a state of a nation address. No one can make debate when the President comes and do that address. So we can give that assurance. We don't know whether we have the mandate, but in terms of our interpretation, uh, they, it is, there is no contradiction. It is safer. No one can come and challenge otherwise because the Constitution makes provision for you to temper with those rights. Or any in other words, uh, uh, foreigners. So once we regulate it, 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 it will negate uh, the other one. We make provision, we, we make reference to the agricultural commission and it says this will attend to us means to be able to, to do that. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, please come in. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, John. I think the critical question here, which is a critical question, is Firstly, uh, Dr. Mpanda has clearly indicated that what we want to achieve in terms of the draft bill does not require an amendment to Article 16 of the Constitution. It can be done in terms of Article 16. One. Now, the critical question we have here is whether we can amend um, Article 16 of the Indian Constitution or Chapter 3. You know, there are even they used to say that the Namibian constitution is one of the best constitutions in Africa, on which, the, which was the basis for drafting the South African constitution. So, I would like to refer you to Article 79 of the Namibian constitution. Article 79 is a critical, Article 79 of the Namibian constitution is one of the most critical uh, constitutional provisions for members of parliament and also any uh, Namibian citizen. But we can hardly use this provision. This provision, since independence was only used twice when we were faced with the question of corporal punishment. And the second time was when we wanted to test the constitutional relationship between the Office of the Attorney General and the Office of the Prosecutor General. Only at those two offenses. So, what Article 79 provides for is that should you have any constitutional issues or provisions which you don't understand or there's a dispute in terms of whether you can do that in terms of any provision of the constitution such as Article 18 and Article 16. So if you have concerns as parliamentarians whether you can amend Chapter 3 of the Constitution, Article 7, um, 
79.2 provides that it basically provides for the Attorney General to approach the Supreme Court directly as the court of best interest. And this is, uh, this is the right in terms together with Section 15.2 of the Supreme Court and of 1990. And that is, that is what the Attorney General did in both instances when Namibia was faced with the question of corporate punishment and the question of uh, the relationship between the Attorney General and the prosecutor general. So what the Attorney General can do, what Parliament can do, is to request the Attorney General to approach the Supreme Court to interpret Chapter 3 of the Indian Constitution. And it can be done even within this month or the next month, where you, the, the Attorney General will approach the Supreme Court directly and give it to the court so we don't waste time when we are challenging the High Court even before you pass this bill. You, the Attorney General takes the draft bill uh, our bill and test the constitutionality of the matter directly now before it's been passed by the parliament through uh, the provisions of Article 79. Where uh, the Supreme Court will hear as the highest court in the country or in the Republic of India will hear and decide firstly on the constitutionality of the bill, secondly, they will hear and decide also on even whether Chapter 3 of the Indian Constitution is also the But we have to use it. It has never been used. Even today, as we are, we are talking, uh, we, uh, before the 2019 elections, when members of, of those who are on party list, uh, politicians on, on party list, were faced with the question that if they are civil servants, they had to resign. That matter could have simply been resolved by the Attorney General approaching the Supreme Court directly and pushing that question whether that is the correct interpretation. But, that is underutilized and underutilized. I don't know whether uh, it's, it's the level of information uh, from also the Office of the Attorney General because he, they are the custodian of, of, uh, of the Indian Constitution when it comes to its interpretation and protection. So when we are faced with these type of questions, I would like to encourage Parliament more um, to approach the Office of the Attorney General through the provisions of Article uh, 792 and Section 15 of the Supreme Court Act to clarify that question of law or that question of, 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 of the Constitution. So I believe that answers your question. Say, for example, we say that Article 45 says members of parliament are representatives of all Namibians. So this is what happens in the practical level. We write ordinary people, government institutions write to the Attorney General and the Attorney General issues out an opinion on those things. So it's also possible using 45 to say that I'm a representative of an opinion because I'm writing to you as Attorney General. Because currently in our, in our current setup as of Parliament, I'm sure that members of Parliament don't even have letterheads. Members of Parliament, they basically supposed to have letterheads by themselves and say, I, as a member of parliament, so and so, right, they only work through their chief ministry and all these things. So, a member of parliament is supposed to have their own letterhead and they write it to the attorney general, I want you to give me an opinion on this, on this matter. Because that's what even local authorities are doing. Ordinary junior people get that service to say, in line with these things. But members of parliament are just, maybe they are because of chief wind discipline and, and all these things, speaker. And, but our members of parliament are very important people. So using 45, we can even also explore that group and say, I want, in order for me to participate, I want Attorney General, can you explore this? If Attorney General says no, you can even go to court. So those provisions, uh, but I'm, I'm just sensitive because of time. Uh, but I thought that there are many questions that uh, I think Mr. Kavir can say. Because now we wait for things to happen in order for us to, to be taken to court. This is not mutual or anything. Thank you very much. Um, there was a hand from Honorable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then Honorable Yambo. Honorable Yambo, first, seems to be good. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, 
Let me also invite back the colleagues from HR. I mean, from AR. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah. uh, first of all, before I start, um, I'm one person who doesn't fear reality. And that reality is we are so I'm apologizing for the decision took long. Twenty it was given twenty nineteen, we are in twenty twenty two. There's no harm to say we are so. If we have not done justice to it, we are apologizing. Yes. I don't even want to start explaining it, claim during the time of budget, after budget, and then I don't want to explain all those things. We are yeah, simply sorry and we are apologizing. It, it, it was really a very, very good petition, but we, as a committee, we can't conclude now. We have to, done, to do justice to all petitions the way it comes to Parliament. It's for us to listen to, to those that have given us the petition and for us to engage other stakeholders. But you are the owner of the petition, of obvious, at the end of the day, not today, at the end of engaging all other stakeholders who will then revert back to you as to what to do with, with, with the petition. So I, I don't want members to start sort of like driving the, the discussions into a conclusion, what we want to do and so forth. And we must equally remember that uh, these are petitioners. They are not people that came to seek. I mean, we, we, are, we should not seek solutions from them. They came to seek solutions from us. So any questions that we should pose should be on, on, on what they have presented. And we must not agenda that. Any general questions that we must pose, we must pose the general based on what is presented to, to us. I have said that uh, 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 Dr. Ampanda referred to, 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 to the Constitution as a, as a, uh, I, I, I don't want to use uh, the way that I did not say, what did you say? A problematic Constitution. You, you somehow say that, or one, one of you say that. I simply just want to say, no, we, we have, the best constitution in the world, as it was said here. But if there is, if there is a constitution that are problematic, let's face those ones. We, we, the normal students are rated the best students when you get, let's say, for example, even in 95, 98. But you, 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 you can't say this. You can't conclude that the student is the best student just because of the two percent that. He or she is missing. It's just a small clarity on that one. And also seeking clarity is when your legal colleague said that if you if we are to table now the proposed bill, this proposed bill must sort of supersede even the, 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 the constitution. Can that be possible or maybe I need to call wrongly? Because the Namibian constitution should remain in the supreme law. But if there is something that is in the proposed bill, but the constitution speaks something different, then while we have this proposed bill, the same terms are raised equally, there's no harm to request for the amendment of that clause in the Constitution in order for them to, to be on par. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further? Oh, yeah. Sorry, Dr. Yes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chairperson. Let me also thank uh, the AR activists Dr. Ampanda and Jim for a real uh, provocative engagement. It's, a, it's provocative because it's eye opening. It's uh, the details that you presented from the history up to the legal and uh, the way forward. I think that, that's very important. Um, <coughs> having said that, um, uh, let 
Let, indeed, was expropriated by subsequent colonizers, Germans. I remember I read, uh, reading about after 1884, in 1890, actually, the German, the, the Bundestag sent a number of uh, settler colonists to come and settle in Namibia, and of course, uh, they were, uh, that is the land that it was expropriated. And I'm glad that details were given as to how many nationalities own land in, in Namibia. Um, having said that, I don't know really, as we are sitting here, or by now, 32 years after independence, whether there is a Namibian that actually understood the resolution for three five five. Because as far as I'm concerned, Resolution 435 crooked us out of our independence, evaded us uh, out of what we deserved. Uh, the Constituent Assembly, I'm glad that there was also a, a question as to the praise, the Constitution, the Constitution, the Constituent Assembly. What are they doing actually? Or what did they, why did they agree to what we have today? But what I know that the party I'm leading now, so I'm not, I mean, they actually refused. A decline of on articles of on Article 16, actually, but then they were majority, minority, yeah? and you know very well that uh, our slogan goes "Give the land back to the people." And as far as I know, and I know the chair, the public chair also talked about or confirmed that indeed the struggle was for the land, but our 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 heroes and heroines bones must must be turning in their graves now that the land is not yet back 32 years after independence. I, I did not hear the young man talking about the Odendal Commission. Maybe I missed it if they mentioned it, but uh, this was not reversed. And uh, uh, 32 years after independence, uh, the people are still in the white stand and, and bandu stand. And I'm also glad that you elaborated on how we are protecting the white stand and what was expropriated is the is the bandu stands, the homelands, or the, 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 the where the black people live. Uh, meanwhile, maybe I bought the four farms. This process actually happened while the second land conference was going on. And I'm glad that someone among you mentioned that it was with the blessing of the, of, the, of the minister. So maybe at this junction one will only ask, who is pulling who? Maybe my last intervention is that of, uh, because uh, Job, I, I'm, I, I, I'm happy the way you are researching things and doing things, and I, I hope that I can take you to task to question or research some of the people who actually are in limbo when, as far as land is concerned. And these are the people who are categorized as MVT. <laughs> they are in the, in the urban areas and they are in the municipal land and in the rural areas they don't have land. And it's a whole uh, 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 research topic that needs to be elaborated and I would also I think uh, because of interest, assist in the process. But otherwise, I really recommend Mike uh, Kamekotora's uh, uh, suggestion that we need more time to to to, to really uh, uh, make make justice to this very important uh, engagement. So maybe if there is a way that we can get uh, uh, organize another time for us to thoroughly talk about these issues, because they are very important, pertinent. Land is everything. I don't agree with the recent uh, issues being talked about that land can make, not make you rich. Land is actually what makes you rich. It's everything. And I thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Yes? Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, regarding the resolution, you the pretty answer the resolution of 435. Uh, uh, I think that the resolution when it was passed, it has it had a number of teeth. So we 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 can we can continue living with a if a decision was taken or if and this decision was taken this this this, this, this agreement was 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 passed by 
political party they don't necessarily my turn. Because the report three five came before the events. It was came to the election, national election, and it, it was maybe even made like if this political party wins, then ABC do should happen. So we are uh, 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 so we 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 can just continue because the uh, resolution was was passed that probably properties should be protected and these are included for a property. Now we must continue living with it. What if this 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 this, this, this political party that 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 agreed to this resolution and independence they were all died and come nineteen ninety one nineteen ninety two it was new political party and they would claim that they are not part of this thing. So we, we our argument that forty five are ah, less profit. Let's face the future. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can you please respond to some of those points uh, that you give gratis? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair and all of the members. Now, the, yeah, is it, some of the questions are very difficult, particularly to the meetings. Um, it's a, you know, it's a very difficult, but I think, in my experience, the is used to liberate us a lot. Let me give you an example. Today, now this time is a season of cultivation. We know very well that when we are in that field on a Saturday, from 6 o'clock, even up until 12, and uh, sometimes when the witches come for the April holiday, whatever work we are doing, those ones, already after 10, they start saying, me and the can't finish it. So they start going. Yeah, so when they leave, and because now out of the children, the children are 10, and five witches decide that they are, they are leaving. So our parents, it become very difficult for them. So when they leave, we also ask, oh, they are also going. So they, they are also, they got an opportunity to be educated. Uh, because they were in every context. Even when we started the liberation struggle, the British ended up having a problem. Because they came from town and they went to exile and they started asking for elections. <laughs> and people, why are you asking for elections in democracy? Because some of them were coming from schools in 1972. And then they ended up with serious problems, as you know. So it's a social, sociological problem that we may not be able to, to solve and understand. And, uh, it's a complex problem that we need to solve. For instance, when we went and I went to secondary school in Mashakati, they used to have this guy that was born in Mashakati. They used to say, Kesu Anutaka. It's like they ate everything, the gangsters and everything. But they, at the end of the day, nothing, what comes out of, of the fact that you are born in Windu? Yeah, we are the Windu cast. The Chinese can come in, Jay Kwa, Christina, and I enjoy the Windu very well. And Rudu and Katina, but they don't be born from there. So, but we also need to emancipate our witches from that mental slavery. Exactly. Where they start attaching to say, I'm from Windu, I'm from Shakati, you have nothing to show. You have no property, you're just born, you are renting for 32 years. Mm -hmm. So, it's a sociological problem that is very difficult to, <laughs> to, to respond. But as far as education and all those things, there's also some positives. That the British uh, used to bring and, uh, and, and, and they, for instance, when when the bread here in window spoils, they don't throw it away; they put it, they dry it, because you can't eat here in the urban because the wheat don't eat bread after six days. They dry it and they put it in the fifty kg sacks and they bring it to the north and we eat. But we don't know that this is uh, some sort of <coughs> yeah, or left or we just think that is the we just dry we is normal. But it's a sociological question and we need to engage because our society has to engage on this question, you yeah. know. Uh, to be able to like look very fascinating to also see that our MPs are also interested in this sociological question. The you asked about the important of the commission. In fact there was a legislative commission first. 
before they wanted that yeah. commission. They wanted that commission in the 1960s or 70s or something. Yeah, 70s. So there was first a native commission. When I was speaking about that aggregate of 32 million hectares of land that was given first, and an additional 7 million hectares of land uh, that was. So the native commission, for example, uh, this is what led to, to this uh, 32 million hectares of land because they wanted to understand this current rule, uh, what, what they later would do. But those commissions, remember we speak of communal land, but within the police zone, so you also have pockets, right? yes, of the boundaries that already were there. Even when the rebels are talking about the corridors, I never understood what the corridor is. Corridor number one, and I used to think corridor is a village. Yeah, when you go to Avenues and other state, because they speak about this with pride, actually discover what the corridor means. It's a little space between the two farms. Yes. So that's corridor number one. They go there and graze there. It's not something to be proud of. Corridor 14, corridor, corridor Why? But it's a very small place, and they, they, they are then congested with their petals and things like that. So, Within the police zone, what they also did, they gave little portion of the for the railroads, for the damas, not necessarily the damas of the south, because the population had decreased and they become few that were there were already um, brought into these farms. Um, so, the project that provision is, it, I, I, we refer to it by referring to those hectares, 32 million hectares. If you go deeper and see how are these hectares allocated, how do people lose the land, how did this battle start? I think the general, in within the police zone, is about 18 million hectares of those communities within the police zone itself uh, by, by that period. What we say by the constitution being problematic is not necessarily the identity of uh, uh, what maybe Let me qualify what we And this same constitution says parliament. Yeah, you know, no, the president can dissolve parliament, and parliament can impeach uh, the president. Assuming today you as MPs decide that you are going to impeach the president at 2 o'clock, you will record it immediately before 2. So, 5 minutes to 2, the president releases a statement, parliament is dissolved. <laughs> what is going to happen? Oh, oh, in other words, that's one of the problematic areas. Not necessarily to me, I don't say the constitution is problematic, but there are many, many problematic areas of our constitution. So you, you, you would see, for example, in this, when you just think about it, if in our country at 16, you can have sex. And you can have sex and produce children. But you cannot vote. But at 18, you cannot get married, although you have already kids. Somebody, I mean, by the time they turn 21, they can easily have four kids, but you are not allowed to marry. And then you can die and go to war and fight and kill and get killed, but you cannot vote. This same constitution says that uh, for you to be president, you must be 35. But even if you are 200, you can be president. <laughs> On the bed, you can be a president because there's no maximum. The constitution put a minimum. Because they didn't want to deal with the youth. But there is no maximum. They will give a presidential candidate that is harder than two. So, those are many, many problematic areas that we speak of the constitution. But with in law, they talk about the technical jurisprudence. And you constantly keep developing, keep improving, because it's not static. You keep changing and, and, and finding a solution to some of those things. What we meant is that uh, we are not saying that the bill will supersede the constitution. No. Nothing will supersede the Constitution. We are saying, and we have seen it uh, how Honorable um, John just uh, did this thing with the Pekka, the public enterprises. What they actually did is that, say, for example, the board of the University of Namibia or a board of, uh, of Midco and Board of Father, there are those laws that say this is how the board must be constituted. They put a provision in the Pekka Act that the Pekka Act prevails all over all the other acts of any SOEs as far as the composition of the board are concerned. In fact, many other things. So they can decide to disregard what is in the, in the UNAM Act, in the Midco Act, in any other act. So
So what we are now saying is, as far as these things that are, once we, we have this legislation that is dealing with the with issues of foreign ownership of land, because people, lawyers are very clever, they find these technicalities. We say, this is a spirit in which we don't want foreigners to own land. If there's some laws that is there, that they can, some programmation, uh, because if there's a net, not a police officer, you know, as a police person, you go to Zulu and you get arrested because of those programmations are still valid today. That is why, it's a conversation on another time, that is why you cannot give your children meat if you are from a poor for the child to the university of Namibia. Because some of those instruments are still there. So the idea is to make sure that if there's any other problem, so that this law can be not defeated. It's like when the lawyers realize that foreigners cannot have agricultural land in that way, in the new dispensation, they just went to lease it. So to close all those people that what we were suggesting is that we are very much aligned with the fact that you have to run this process, we have to consult widely. Uh, but what we are saying is that this does not have it, 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 it. We are not, there are certain things that we, we push passionately. Yes, we agree with speech. We, are, we, we actually hope that this generation of members of parliament, 104 of you, you should somehow, it does not necessarily have to be written the way, the commas, the way we are putting it, but the principles to protect our land, help this land. For example, we are saying, let's assume that this, they are foreigners who own the land. If the owners, if we prohibit them from selling to other land, ultimately we don't have that land now, and legally this person has the right, but we will have it later. Because ultimately when they die, or when they want to sell it, they cannot sell it to another foreigner. Ultimately it's a matter of time. Even if after 50 years, it will come back to our children. That's what we seek to, to do. And we thought that uh, you would even improve it better. You would even have better suggestions, uh, because you deal with these things uh, every day. The mistake would be that they did. some of you forget, some of you don't ask politics, some of you pray for us, some of you will follow exactly in your process. So it's like sometimes even your kids at home can come and say, but I think money, this thing is not, it must change. Sometimes you don't agree, sometimes you don't have money, but ultimately you will come in the way you are able to solve uh, that problem. That's what we are dealing with you. At least we know that if there's something that we are going to do right, to protect the land, and you are not protecting the land because of our partner, you will also protect this land for your children. Because uh, the reality is that we are not going to be around, and then when we are not going to be around, this country it will be like Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka now does not own the port, eh, and the airport as well. Because the, the decision that was taken by previous generation, because we always want to blame, but I think with this blame, all of us are coming at the same time. We are coming at the same time, we are identifying the problem at the same time, and hopefully we are able to solve uh, uh, this problem at the same time. I don't know whether I think so, but you want to add anything. We have uh, all of that, but quickly, if there's something that you want to add, and perhaps before I give you the floor, I, I want you also perhaps to cater for my query on the communal land. Communal land two, where you are saying in allocation of communal land to a foreigner national, before this act shall be deemed to have been an illegal transaction, and shall be that way. How safe are we going to be when it comes to legal wise of these people own or land already the land? And here we are saying it should be uh, indicated. We, here we will be, the police will come, we will be safe. In fact, there's even a recent judgment. There was a, there was a Chinese and an Egyptian recently who got married in north of the Red Line. And then they were saying, because they, they were married north of the Red Line, uh, what was it? They are married out of community of property. Yeah, they are married out of community of, of, of property. So, but they were relying, they went to court and say they were using that proclamation. The response of the court was to say, no, no, the natives, these things of the natives, you are not a native. <laughs> the Chinese is not a native, the Egyptian is not a native. That's what the court already pronounced on that issue of the, 
when they were trying to get properties from one another. So, uh, for us, the communal rate is very, very necessary because that's where the vulnerable are, the uneducated and unempowered. If we allow foreigners to go in there, where people are already poor, in fact, we are also trying to protect the poor from themselves. Because what was happening when they were doing this land money, these business people were building these homes, these guys simply just went to withdraw 5,000 and they withdraw in 50, the one, 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 and then the old lady in the house, bring your, your basket. And those guys started giving count, count maybe. Fifty dollar, fifty, hundred, one, 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 until the woman even start getting tired of counting. But it's just five thousand. But it's five thousand in the multiples of fifty dollars, and they make a decision right away. You know, before you know it, while you are here, your grandmother has solved the question. That's how vulnerable those people are in communal and then be it in the Pakistan, be it in the Republic, be it there, wherever they are. So we don't want foreigners there at all. So it must be the least that you can see in the current context how it is. So then they don't belong the the how land land in the communal land is owned by the state. But the traditional leadership administer that land on behalf of the state. There will be no foreigner who is part of the pastor community, who is part of the, the rural community, who is part of the of, of those things. So these are not members of the indigenous communities that are administered land through customary law on behalf of the state. So we are safe because uh, we just give them out. Mm -hmm. because, because imagine if we allow them, these timber the Chinese will go there in the village and they will start uh, becoming headmen. And some community people will just. The communities are so vulnerable because remember, to be headmen, if a headman dies, you just go to the district and you apply for it. And there's no one, that's why some villages are not headmen. So, what is the Chinese, in terms of our law, Chinese goes and want to become a head of the here. We must just keep them out at all. They must not own land, they must not utilize the land in there. They must only utilize the land in some different uh, context. But we are saying already in terms of case law, but we are also saying in terms of customary law. They would have to say, how do you say you are a Chinese? Uh, you are part of this community. How do you want, what, what is your ancestry that you can take? I know that in many other countries of India, there are those Finnish children, missionaries who speak local languages. But we also have Namibians here that speak uh, Chinese. In America, you can become a president, but you, a black person can become a president, but you will never be an American. They will call you African American. But here we are very accommodating. We don't say German Namibians. They are just Namibians. Because we are very accommodating. The day we allow foreigners, to go to, to those bantu stands and communal that that will be the end of it. That's the only last defense line that you have. Uh, maybe just to come in uh, where Honorable uh, Fede highlighted the issue of, of um, conflict of laws. What if, in terms of the other provision, uh, I think it's very clear that the Indian Constitution, in terms of Article uh, 1, is, is the supreme law. But one thing that we don't understand is that, for example, we we already have, we already have an ex expropriation ordinance, the team of 1978. Currently, right now, the state can expropriate any place of that ordinance. It, it doesn't only extend to farmland, in terms of the ordinance, which was obviously used as a colonial tool, the state can come to your property and temporarily take ownership of your house to use it for something. They will compensate you at their own determination of that such compensation. Obviously, probably the ordinance will face constitutional challenges or so. But we are saying there's a lot of these proclamations that are set out by the uh, colonial regime, which the state can use. But which we, we, out of fear of, of those proclamations, we set it out very clear also that the act, um, the length, the, this bill will take precedence over any other act, not over the constitution. Obviously, the constitution is supreme law. The moment I, I bring up such an argument, I'm, I'm sure you now will eventually take back the law. Thank you.
Yes, uh, I think, Che, what we've really been saying is that uh, we must take cognizance that the rent will never increase, but it's decreasing at a very fast rate because of the existing laws that we have, because of the nature how we conduct our business. So we must take it very serious that it is one of the most pertinent thing that we must at least try to save. Because production will still continue. Windu Gelong has about 100,000 people living in this former settlement. Cabinet took a decision to expand Windu to accommodate everyone. 70% of that land does not belong to Windu, the municipality of Windu. Yes, it's in their jurisdiction, but they don't own it. Why? Because it belongs to the hands of the settlers. So when the settlers were living and the new independence was coming, they ensured that all these communal farms that we have around Windu are in the hands of the settlers. So it becomes very difficult, even for administration, for local authorities, to make provision for housing for people. So that is in the context that we bring this draft bill to you. To appeal to your conscience and say it's not because we want to do it, but it is because we don't have it. Even when we want to do the best to do whatever they want to do in terms of house, they can't because they are restricted and this land belongs to the settlers. So in other words, we have many of our people that will always say that you know, we are going home. That going home literally means that they are going into a corridor or a portion of a farm of a settler. So even other tribes that say they are going home, place they call home is a place that they are given because they are great grandmothers and generational family. They don't have dignity. They don't have and, and, and Benedict is saying that land is spiritual, land is culture. So we are already limiting a specific sector of Namibians who were exterminated to practice their culture because they don't have access to that land. We are now discussing 70% of that agricultural commercial land that are in the hands of white people. Yes, we recognize. Uh, these ones that are here. But let us deal with the ones that are not here first. It's a process to ultimately getting that land back. So let us not lose sight of the discussion. We are saying that urban land is very important because we are now speaking about the practical examples. Sinaru owns Windu, Rundu, everywhere. Jaguar, the same. But the, nobody is taking a decisive decision to say, what if the Namibians who also want to do property development? <coughs> How can Namibians assist Namibians get access to that land? But because of practices that we are having, this is what is, the, what is happening. And therefore we are saying, if Stinamu is developing in a hanging, at least 51% of that development must belong to Namibians. Beneficial, Ownership of Namibians. In no matter what how you look at it, you, the person may never be a proxy. So we take it a step further and say we realize that there are black people who are given two million, you only show up when they are doing valuation. So we are saying this person must actually get the true value of what is happening and of those proceeds. So we are very clear when we are saying that the foreigners can lease. Then yes, we're very clear. So we don't want a system where 99 years ago and all no those other things um, that are there. So we are available for further consultations with the bill. We make ourselves available the day, the 18th of March 2019, when we took a decisive decision to bring the bill. So it doesn't matter at whatever time uh, that you require input from us. We shall be ready and available to do that. In, and in conclusion, I want to leave the committee with this uh, 
went to say that who feeds you ultimately controls you. So let that sink in and us analyzing really where we want to go with this deal. To say that, do we want to feed ourselves so that we can only control ourselves, or do we still want to remain beggars of those who feed us? Because ultimately, we control us. Thank you. Yeah, just short, uh, we didn't probably explain uh, Madam Chair. Yes, yes, yes Madam Chair. Just one minute. Yes, Madam Maria, I've been a lot of Okay, we didn't explain this thing of Chelsea. And it's quite very important for us. Maybe you can also very interested in what they did. The British Parliament just met and they decided that the property, you see, in Namibia we are scared. No, we have Article 16 and what, 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 what. The Parliament met because of the war in Ukraine. The properties, the profits, and everything that Ibrahimovic owns, he, he no longer owns them. So we are safe now. Sorry. Um, take also into consideration Article 21, Subsection H. On which one? Which one? Okay. 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 Um, I want you just to make sure that the situation is not in the situation. Oh yes, we know that very well. Get to verification. It says that all what has to happen here, to those principles, you can improve on them. Yeah. So in other words, what we are doing with the bill, we are not de de derogating. We are not moving away because we are using uh, 16 subsection one that says that you can prohibit, you can regulate. So we are moving away. We believe, by the way, that uh, the, the, we must amend the constitution, but we are saying we will come later for that. That is a long, long, long journey. Yeah, so we want now to use already what is available. So white people, but now let's focus on the foreigners. For now, we will come with later. We will those one and the That's the focus that we are talking about. The British, whom we are scared of, have taken the assets of Abu Ibrahim to the Russian. So they will no longer come and say, you have taken the farm. We will make reference to the jails that have been taken. That's what they did. So, what they did to Abraham it actually even makes it easier for us. What Europe is doing to the Russian business people, these people are also business people. Their citizens here are business people. Just like what they've done there, we can even do it. So, we, we, it's a painful thing. People are dying in Ukraine. Our constitution says that we, we must advocate for peaceful means. But it's to say, let's be less assured. There will be no issue. We have a case law in the confiscation of Chelsea. We will take our, our properties here because we learn from them. So let's not worry about what the British have said because they've given us a good example. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, Honorable members, uh, Dr. Amanda and your team, uh, we have reached the end of the beginning of our consultation. It was a, a very good presentation with an eye openers on some of the information that we are not aware of. And uh, I just wanted also on the on the meaning of the corridor. In Oshiwambo we have the house. The house in Oshuambo is Onkara, the corridor. Yeah, meaning that if you are living in that corridor of the house, what benefit do you get from there? That is the, the, the example that I just wanted to, to clarify what the corridor means. Uh, having said that, I, as I alluded to earlier, that uh, this is the beginning of our consultation. The bill has opened up uh, our eyes and ears, and we are now going to um, to invite those stakeholders, the submissions area, and from there procedurally, we also have to go to the grassroots level to our communities 
where many stakeholders, as you are also indicated, will take part and uh, will, will find a way forward. And after we have done so, we will, will bring the report to the House. And that's where we are now going to be guided by all members of Parliament that are not part of this committee and during the discussions, I think we will find a way to address the concern of, of, of the end. Even me, as I'm sitting here, I do not have a piece of pain. <laughs> what about my children? So, and my children are not that biological children. Is every Namibian child is is our child. Uh, therefore, I really do appreciate your coming. And uh, sorry for the delay again. It was not a deliberate thing. It was just the situation was uh, beyond our control, and we all know. Hence, one says it's never. Eh, never it's better late than never. Better late than never. So here we are today. After consultation, if there is a need to call you back again, we will do so. Otherwise, with these few uh, remarks, I would like to sincerely thank you once more again, honorable members.